So the Eiffel Big Six, for lots of people, will know what the Big Six are, um, especially if you come from Africa. Um, so this was suggested by Rima and Teresa when they said, because originally I said, when I'm teaching digital research skills to librarians and to researchers, um, originally we spoke about the Aussie Five, five skills that Austra all Australian researchers need to know. And we've just adapted these and expanded them, especially for Eiffel. And we've also made it a little bit tougher because you're so much more experienced and, and capable of so much more. So let's take a look at this. This could be called Fantastic Beasts and How to Find Them. So first of all, this is where I come from, but not exactly this place because this beautiful library is in Trinity College Dublin. The, the university was founded in 1592. It was the first university that the, the British crown set up in a colony, in their first colony, which was Ireland. We spent nearly 800 years trying to get rid of that, but we kept some good things, including the, the library and the university here. So this library um, is, is where I work, and there, this is where Ireland is, just in case anybody doesn't know. There's a tiny little dot in the Atlantic Ocean on the western side, and it is not in the United Kingdom. I'm just mentioning that. So, <laughs> the, um, so just to get that straight, where I am is not in this old, old, old area, this beautiful heritage collections. Mine is the area I work in. We call it research informatics. So that's a fancy name that nobody really knows what it means, least of all me. So, but it sounds good. It was invented by our VP for research, who was a brilliant biochemistry um, professor, and he was very involved with bioinformatics. So we think this idea of informatics is a good way to describe. We know about metadata is data about data, so informatics is information about information, right? So um, it works well for us. Um, so in this unit in the library, um, which I run, and it sounds very fancy. There's actually only two to three of us here, and we do this. We run the research information system for the university that we built ourselves. Um, and that profiles everybody and, and lists all of the publications and other research outputs in the university. That includes theatre performances and symphonies, and as well as books and book chapters and journal articles. Why? Well, when it comes to talking about bibliometrics in more detail tomorrow, We'll see why we need to have our, our own record of this, but you don't have to have it if you can't afford it. We also run the institutional repository that's linked to this and all of these other things, the metrics and resources. We do, for our sins, the research evaluation for the university for the, of the academics. The library is a neutral space. They can trust us not to have favourites. Um, and there's a whole lot of other things that we do the kind of skills that we're talking about here comes into this work that I do on a daily basis. We're, up until recently, we were the only part of the library who worked in this area, but we've had to change that because we're a victim of our own success. Now, because we started producing all this information, everybody wants it, everybody, from the students to the supervisors to the um, top professors, they all want this information. And the senior management in the university wanted to. So we have to figure out a way to be able to train people and get this information across quickly and get, bring everybody up to the same level in the library and in the rest of the university too. Plus we work on a national basis as well to try and pass on what we've learned to other institutions as well. So we spend a lot of time training people. This beast is the first animal. It's not one of the big six, but it's pretty big. And I put it in for Teresa because she likes it so much. It's the Irish wolfhound. The Irish wolfhound is a large dog, a very large dog from a very small country. It's known to be strong, gentle and very brave, especially when dealing with wolves. And reminds me of a lot of the librarians that I know. So... Um, so you can keep in mind this, this brave creature when we're looking at this. It's surveying the landscape. And the landscape that we're looking at here, the research information landscape, has all of these different areas in it. There are research profiles um, that could be owned by you yourself. You could have in-house information. 
or it can come from the outside. There are citations and metrics, and we've heard a lot about that already from Milan, who's working this system brilliantly from, from um, various angles in the university. Um, Ireland is going to be showing you some other amazing examples of how metrics, these metrics can work for the university and for your country as well, um, and for individual researchers. There's a whole lot every day. There's nearly something new coming into this area. Some of these resources cost a ridiculous bless you, bless you, a ridiculous, <laughs> some of them cost a ridiculous amount of money, I have to say, you know, it's almost disgraceful what some of the suppliers are charging for this and what some of us are prepared to pay for it as well. There are identifiers um, that we'll become familiar with and there are all kinds of specialist repositories and platforms that can give us information here. So what do we do with all of this to deal with? you um, information so let's take a look this is what Rima showed us about the training for researchers that they say that they're the same requirements that are coming from the library environment as from the researchers so looking at the librarians they're saying that they're confident with some of these areas that are up, up here the bibliom bibliographic searching the um, how to do citations and references plagiarism these kind of areas, they're the backbone. They're, they, we do these kind of things all the time. But the newer areas of publication strategies, collaboration research, um, collaborative research, this whole business of research data management, um, the data management plans, the research assessment and evaluation, and post-publication impact. These are new areas for a lot of librarians, and yet they're areas with amazing potential for librarians to show that they can stand shoulder to shoulder with their academic colleagues and really help them in, in ways that they've never thought about before. So the suggestion that we make is to try and simplify this in order to bring everybody up to, to a similar level. So we've, I've taken the, these questions, research data management, collaborative research, publication strategy, post-publication, and research assessment, and look at, you, you can look at the what and the, and the how, the central columns, and I've translated them into what we're calling the Eiffel Big Six focus. So we're going to say, even though we know there are a lot of specialist tools that can come in for scholarly communication on digital humanities or biochemical research, we're saying every researcher and every librarian, regardless of their, um, their discipline, needs to have a bottom line. And once they have these, they could walk into a laboratory or a classroom or a library anywhere in the world. And not only could they know what the, speak the language that everybody else is speaking, whether it's Australia, whether they walk into Harvard or Princeton, or whether they walk into um, Macquarie University or wherever they are, the same basic principles will be the same. So this is what we're talking about, is the Eiffel Big Six. The first one, so we're looking at, these are the Big Six, and the Big Six, obviously everybody from Africa knows the Big Six, traditionally was... The bad, bad old days for hunting, you know, the big game animals. Now we're talking about environmentally conscious people, people who want to, um, who are interested in these animals as part of nature and as part. So we're taking these as metaphors for our own big six. The first one, this is an animal that you will all recognize. It's well camouflaged. It can be almost invisible, but if it wants to eat, it has to come out in the open. In fact, it has to distinguish itself. This brings us to number one on the Eiffel's big six, which is the orchid number. Every researcher needs to have their orchid number. And the library can lead by example, by have, making sure that maybe I'll talk about the, the levels of, of detail that are appropriate for different people within the library but for at least the faculty and liaison librarians. And any librarian who is involved in doing research, we can see all the work that people are doing here, writing papers, doing conference proceedings. You need an ORCID ID. You can lead by example, not only by getting your ID for free, and we've got, I've got a bunch of a folder that I've given to Ed Valdes, which has the step-by-step -step instructions. Um, those of you who were in Moldova two years ago and were tortured by me in a laboratory, some of you are nodding your heads. I know the experience was painful, but 
hopefully useful. <laughs> so I still have the step-by-step -step instructions for the ORCID ID, right? So we, you can look these up afterwards if you want to. The main thing about the ORCID ID is not don't just get one, use it. Put it on your web page, put it on your email address, show by example, and when you're emailing your academic colleagues, they'll be able to see, oh look, the librarian has a, an ORCID ID, I should have one too, you know? And link through with that and use it and show how it's used. You use the ORCID ID for lots of things, for using it on personal address, it puts it on your business card, um, use it when you're publishing. A lot of publishers are looking for this now. Start to use the ORCID ID. Second one. So this, again, is another creature who has a very strong presence, a clear reputation, and commands esteem. It brings us to our second of the Eiffel Big Six. You need a validated current research profile and that can be, and we teach this to all of our researchers, even the students, either an institutional ID, which is the CV for the university, if you have a system for doing that. So you're going to need that bottom line if you work in the institution. That's for the librarians as well as for the, for the researchers. An ORCID profile that goes with your ORCID ID number. And possibly, if you've got time, a portable um, profile, one that you can take someplace with you if you move around the, the, the world. This um, could be a, Google, a validated Google Scholar uh, profile, or there are some others that, we, that I've got some examples of. And there's some basic rules around them, but the idea is to try and give one that's validated by the research, that, or that's kept up to date, and that's linked in with, if you have a Google Scholar profile, that it has the ORCID number on it, the institutional profile should link to the ORCID um, profile and join them up. So, and there are all kinds of specialist ones as well. People always ask about ResearchGate and academia. To me, yeah, they're okay, they're fine. But first, focus on these, these main ones that we've got. The thing about ResearchGate and academia, they're going to be bought up by, well, some already by Elsevier. Um, they may disappear overnight. So if they work for you right now, today, good. That's fine, but they could be gone in the morning. So, you know, that's the risk that you take. So that's number two. And this is the big one. The biggie um, we've got here, it's powerful, very powerful in the right environment. It's frequently misunderstood and it really needs to be treated with a lot of respect and care. It could be Asian and Af or African. So um, that is metrics. And what I've done with the metrics here, usually I separate out metrics into metrics, the traditional bibliographic metrics of, um, uh, about publications, citations, citations per paper, the H-index, those metrics, and I separate alt metrics. This is the first time I've brought alt metrics into the mix with the metrics because alt metrics, I believe, are now mainstreamed. They are now being used in, pro in research project proposals, they're being put on people's CVs, on their job applications. They're starting, we're starting to see them not on their own, but alongside, but with others. Tomorrow we'll be looking at tools for altmetrics, for using altmetrics, and how you can get them and how you can use them. So we'll be going into them in some more detail. And in addition, you can see number three down here. I've also put in something, again, part of what's known as next generation metrics. Those are open research metrics. Again, the kind of things Milan was talking about, analyzing your research, these things complement one another. So where you can see the publications of your academics, of your institution, you can have a look then and see where are the citations, you can look at the social media hits through all metrics, and you can see where they are available on open access that you can see the hits and the downloads, etc. So those metrics are coming in to give a really balanced picture of impact from a quantitative point of view, those numbers. But we're saying those numbers, that's why they need to be treated with care. The numbers don't work for everything. They don't work for languages. They don't work for theatre studies. These figures do not work for that. So they have to be handled with care, but they are very, very powerful in the right hands. Um, tomorrow, again, I'll give you an, ex an example of how in Ireland, using the metrics, we saved the national investment in research, the funding, one year when it was going to be cut. With a single bibliometric statistic, we changed the government's mind and they gave more money into 
the national research in Ireland than they did the previously when they were going to cut the whole thing. So bibliometrics can help. So um, as I say, it's a big one that we'll look at in more detail tomorrow. This one is they don't look that harmless, uh, that harmful, do they? They kind of look like cows, but they've got very sharp horns. They're con actually, I've read that they're considered, the Cape Buffalo is considered to be the most dangerous animal in, Af in Africa. It's organized, it's a group effort, it is collaborative, it is free ranging, it is highly disruptive. In the Eiffel Big Six, it's open access. Open access that is changing the face of the entire scholarly publication environment. With what we're teaching, when we're translating this into these five, six things that we're, we're teaching every researcher, we're telling them, if you are going to be up to scratch and you're going to be as good as, let's say, your colleagues in the University of Melbourne, your top five publications, or whatever they are, are at least as much of them as you can make available, maybe the introduction to a book, maybe it's a part of it, but they're, they're going to be av made available on open access, freely open access that we can track through our repository, not out in the wild. We can see them, not just published in gold, but to where we can see them, so we can track them. And you can use them for promotions and build them into, in my institution, compliance with the institution. We do have a mandate, which of course we don't really track, but this is where we're supposed to do this. Maximising social impact, attracting collaborators and funding, attracting students. And we have lots of stories we've collected around this that we tell our researchers how open access papers out on the, on the web have brought in postgraduate um, scholars from Canada who are interested in the work, um, who have attracted funders because they've seen these papers out on the web. So this is all about the impact. Number five, and this is just a baby in the middle of all this, who, who has a lot of potential can be hidden and, and very vulnerable and needs a lot of ongoing care and support. It is data management. Data management that we try and make as simple as can be, it can turn into a big, huge, hairy thing that you can't really control. We're trying to manage it through data management plans. So I've given, again, in the resources pack, I've given some slides on data management plans, the links to the resources, how to do them. It's something we're all learning about and we're learning about them together. The European Commission recently um, made it mandatory for their funded projects. So we had to, we, everybody make, putting in a proposal had to do this. And now we've just seen in Europe, Science Europe has, is just about to launch a generic data management plan that all of the funders in Europe have agreed that they're going to adopt. And it looks very like the DMP online, the data management plan online that comes free, a free tool that comes from the Digital Curation Centre. Again, I've got all of these links in the background documents, so we're just talking at the high level here. This is doable. Not only is it doable, it is a brilliant way for librarians to come in and first of all to train themselves and their colleagues and then to start to train the researchers at every single level. But ideally starting at the young ones, you know, at the, at the little ones coming in so that you can start to, and they start teaching their supervisors and their professors as well. So there's a lot of advantage to this. And then finally, we've got, we've got this one. This one that you would expect massive impact from, and this is new, I've added this in, especially for Eiffel, because I think there's huge potential here. Capable of real impact, but elusive. It's increasingly rare it's much sought after and sometimes attributed with magical properties, which can be dangerous for it as well. So what this is, is actually an impact statement. It's a, this is the one area that moves away from the quantitative information. And this is about training ourselves and our researchers about the qualitative side. This is about describing the societal, economic, or cultural impact of our research. Again, our funders are now asking us internationally to include this in their research grant proposals. We have to look into a crystal ball or whatever way, prophetic ways we have to figure out, look into the future and say, what, when we're writing the proposal, what do we think the impact is going to be? They're not talking about citations. They're not talking about papers in nature or in anything else. They're talking about what difference this research is going to make to the world. 
Some of our researchers fight this, especially the young ones, and especially in, um, in areas like literature, because they correctly say, we don't, we don't have an impact. In fact, actually, I can go back further. We can say, with the previous one, some of our researchers say, we don't have any data. We turn around, yes, you, you do have data. You have data, it doesn't, might not be big data. When you go back to the previous one, have you got a list of names? Have you got an index for a book? Have you got you know, a compilation of any kind of um, um, items on a list, on a spreadsheet? Those are data. With the impact, of course, there may be basic research that could be years um, ahead. There may not be any visible impact. But where there is a possible impact, the, the proposal stage is when you start thinking about it. And the skills of being able to communicate impact is something that most of our researchers are really, really bad at. Maybe some librarians aren't so good at it too. We don't know. Because we have to try it and see. This is a great area for workshopping with researchers, especially you can get a whole group of them together from different disciplines. You give them a one-page template, which I have supplied in the folder that I've, I've got there with hints on what to put into it. And you can ask them to write that in a one-hour seminar, tell them what you want, and then ask them to stand up and communicate that to people in a different discipline and see if it, it makes sense. And that can help everybody to grow their understanding of how to go about doing this. There's a fantastic resource many of you may have seen because the UK um, used impact case studies, as they called them, for 25% of their national research evaluation um, programme called the REF um, in 2014. I think it's going up even higher. The weighting of it is going up even higher um, the next time in 2021. So we know that all of the researchers in the UK are used to this idea of research impact case studies. When we find we invite international reviewers to come in and to do quality reviews of our programmes, our research programmes, inevitably they're going to come from the UK, lots of them come from the Netherlands where they're thinking along these lines. And the first thing they say is, where's your impact statement? They're looking for this information in particular ways. So if we can think ahead of this, we're ahead of the game, then we're ready for them. And we've trained our, our researchers and our librarians into doing this. But not only that, we can really make change happen through these kind of tools. We can actually change the impact of the research and help to get it out there. Those are our big six. Just going back to this whole area of the training, the literacy training. We have the same issue that everybody else had, is how to deal with this huge mass of information. We've only got a tiny number of staff to deal with this. Um, what will we do? And we shared some information with some visiting librarians. Actually, I'm just checking my time. They, um, librarians who came from places like the University of Melbourne was one. And they said, how do you do this? How do you train people? And they looked at the unit that I was in and they said, how many people have you got working there? And I said, I, on a good day, we've got two, maybe three people. Um, and they said, well, we were the same. So they had to change the way they did things. And this is what they did. And we've started to... This is what we've, in my institution, have started to work on. And it seems to be working quite well. What we decided was that we'd have a, a pyramid. I know we hate hierarchies, right? But still, we have, sometimes we have to do this. The aim is that the, all of the library staff will have some information about these areas. They will be backed up by web pages, which will have the information and they will be kept up to date. So this is staff on the counters, on the information desks. When they're asked a question about where do I go to to find information about this, they know where to send people, and that's all they know straight off. We discovered that our subject, our faculty liaison librarians, were really looking for new roles. They wanted ways to be able to interact with the researchers on a different level. They're great with the, at the student level, very good, really fantastic at finding resources for the students, as we know, for the staff, um, using their purchasing power where they can to find journals, and they've been great at that. But they're also aware of the fact that they need to get to know more about the research that's going on in the institution and to be able to help with that. So, the, <clears throat> excuse me, our faculty and, and, and uh, liaison librarians are now trained by myself and my colleague Ashling. 
we, we were running workshops, we're just about to do the fifth one, which is on research data management at a particular kind of a level. So we're, we're actually using this Eiffel 6 um, already, and we've started them off with these areas, first getting them the ORCID ID, then getting them to build their research profile so they know how to do it and they know the options, then getting them to look at the metrics, the early stages, the simple ones, and then more advanced ones. Now we're going into research data management. They're trained and supported that when up to the stage where we can trust, we can, we can then rely on them to do one-to-one -one consultations with their um, opposite members on, in, the, um, in the research area, in the academic area, and with um, research students. Um, they can also um, train and inform the others, but they interact with the people who are the two or three people in the organisation who know the most about this. Or maybe you'll just have one person, if you're lucky, who knows everything about this, but can put this information together and scale it. So these people, these experts, are responsible for training the trainers, designing the training materials, updating the web pages, troubleshooting. As I say, the environment is, is moving on, it's changing all the time. So it's their job to try and keep the others informed. But it's in, that's people like me, it's in my interest to do that because it saves me time. And it's, it's the right thing. It's the natural evolution. We started being out on a limb, doing something new, and now it's becoming part, and this is a really good thing, it's becoming part of the mainstream work of the library with the right kind of training. So what does that training look like? Well, let's have a look at the researchers that, um, as well that we're, we're um, thinking about. These R1, R2, R3 and R4, those are what the European Commission decided that they were going to call the different stages of the research career. So we find this quite useful and people will, will often refer to R1 to R2 researchers. The R1 are, they are graduate students, postgraduate students and students just coming out of their PhD programme. So they're very, very, very early. They're under supervision. And the European Commission has a document, which I have a reference to, which says all of these competences that these, these researchers should have at this particular stage. They're talking about a researcher level as being a career stage. So we could actually be considering ourselves to be researchers as well. Every one of our researchers, they could be um, a historian, they could be a mathematician, but they're also a researcher on a particular stage of their career path. And there's an idea of trying to turn researchers into an actual career. So this first stage, they're expected to have certain competences. Um, they're supposed to have um, essential ones that are up front and then desirable ones. And what I added as part of the work I did for the Open Science Policy Platform was to add in new competences that would fit in under an open research or an open science world. And that's what we're talking about. That means things like research integrity and research ethics, open access, publication and dissemination, data management plans. Do you see? This is where our... Um, our big six are coming in here and then more um, information that's coming in at different levels so that would give us targeted at these areas the Eiffel big six at this at the earliest level those are our postgraduate students our doctoral students and research by masters second the postdocs the postdoctoral researchers we've got a lot of them in the university they're people who are many of them are writing grant proposals they're publishing and they're writing a lot of the of the articles and maybe the PIs are you know um, supervising them and doing that so there's their competences that you can look at afterwards and the desirable ones some of those desirable ones are about communication understanding the value of their research promoting the work for technological societal or cultural advancement so again this is where our big six are coming in here they should have the first level and they should also have a more sophisticated level of analysis at this stage they're starting to build up their pub own publications so they will have statistics personally for themselves that they'll want to use they should know exactly what their h index is their numbers of citations their citations per paper at a minimum so there's there's a absolute level at which they they have to have 
it won't surprise you to see the next, the established researcher should have um, IFA Big Six levels one and two, plus the ability to mentor their colleagues and to look at further development. And finally, the final stage, the highest stage, this is our PI, this is somebody who's a senior person in the university, they're the leading researcher. Again, every one of those should understand these basic principles to the highest level, be involved in mentoring, developing those programs and supports, hopefully for the library, in buying the tools, for example, that we need to do to, and supporting us to do this, and taking a leadership role, both within the institution and at the national level. So it's actually part of our job to, to not just train the trainers, but to lead the leaders in this, in this area, in our, within our institutions, in the way that we do it in libraries in a very gentle, non-aggressive um, way, but with evidence to back up everything that we're doing, that we show and that we, we say them, and it works. So just to recap them, the Eiffel Big Six, here they are. None of them are standalone, they all are interlinked. Tomorrow, Arnold and I are going to be looking at, the, at that big one over there in the right-hand corner at the metric side of it, but every one of those are absolutely vital to us, and that's what they, that's what they are again. In order to look at the kind of training, you will all have your own ideas, and I'm sure your own experiences of doing this, I'm sure I could learn a lot from what your experience is too. The very desirable thing that we've learned from what we're doing so far, and we're really only just beginning this, and we, I think we can all do a huge amount, learn, we can make a lot of progress by sharing information in this area and trying to share best practice and experiences of this. What we've discovered is that we know this wonderful work going on with Foster, for example, that Irena and, and Foster Plus and, um, are involved with. But we also know from a survey that was done in Europe and repeated in various places that on the ground, most researchers, most research students really don't understand these things. They don't. And even though there's all that information out on the web and fantastic tools and MOOCs and online training programs that are available for free, they still don't get it. They don't understand it. You have to bring it down to home and to reality and show them what it means for them and how it's going to give them an advantage and, and, and to work for them. We also find that a lot of our researchers they actually don't like um, boasting. They've, they're kind of you know, shy to some extent. They, they don't like that kind of thing. So what I always say to them is, this is not, you're not doing this for you, although they probably are, but you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for your students. You're doing it for your discipline. You're doing it for your country. You're doing it for the good of the world. That's why you're promoting the work. So it's not always just for selfish reasons. But to help the, the researchers at every level, if it's possible to get a structured, standardised courses that are accredited, so the researchers can actually have this badge. Ideally, we'd be looking for an international driver's licence for this kind of thing. So we, are, we, individually, as librarians, or our fellow researchers, could walk into the University of Qatar, the, of, of, um, of any place in the world, and we've got this certificate that says we're competent in these areas. You don't have to start training us in this stuff. We know about it. We know how to do open access. We can do data management. We can, we've got an ORCID ID. We've got our profiles. That's done. We can start moving on to the real societal and cultural impact side of it. It's really important in order to get this to link in with parts of the university, if you can, like HR. We found HR coming to us. The, human resources because they wanted us to train the new people coming in every September, October they came to us and said we've got a new batch of people, tell them what they need to do so we started again doing an early version of what's become the, the Eiffel Big Six and that's what we, we train them in with as well. Our HR our human resources department sat in on these things usually thinking they were going to be bored but a little bit started going into their heads as well and they realised they were going for accreditation, human resources accreditation for staff development. I never heard of this before, but that's they said you can you can come with us and try and get an accredited badge for this program. So we're starting. I don't know uh, how we're going to get on, but we're going to try it anyway. Linking in with other institutional policies like the research strategy is really good. If you can get a say in what the research strategy says, that would be really good. As in. 
the university research strategy says everybody should have an ORCID ID. That really helps when it comes to training people, or everybody should have their top five publications available on open access. You choose what the top are, just show us where they are. Everybody has to have a profile, etc. So that really helps. And working with the research office and with other areas helps as well. Having your trained and informed library staff is your secret weapon. That's how it really works. Your university, like mine, has no idea how to deal with these challenges. They come to the library because we're the only ones who have any hope of understanding. We're the only unit within the university who are going to have um, be able to understand the value of an ORCID ID, you know? We know about why it's important to disambiguate uh, readers, so um, our readers um, disambiguate um, authors in order to get the maximum impact for them, make sure their citations don't get mixed up with somebody else's. That, of course, is going to affect the university because if the university is losing citations because the authors are mixed up with somebody else, are they affiliated to the wrong institution, which happens, and I know Arnold's going to talk about a bit about this, that's going to hit you in the university rankings, in your country rankings. So it starts at this level and it grows and grows and grows. It's very scalable. Um, the kind of formats. Rima's already mentioned that what are very popular is a workshop format, and yes, we use them all the time, and the one-to-one, -one, she was saying, with us, we have these. We try to promote these kind of walk-in clinics, which are kind of a similar thing to one-to-one. -to -one, but people can bring, come in with their friends, or students can come in together. How it groups, mentoring. So we try and get ambassadors within the institution. They're often within a school, and they will sit down. They'll do a one-to-one, -one and they go, "Hey, everybody needs to know about this. I'm going to organise a research forum, maybe as part of something else that's going on in this in my school, and." Um, will you come in and give people these basic things? And we'll monitor them. And then you start to get someplace. You start to work with the faculty in that. Um, peer mentoring um, by students. And this idea of embedded assignments and relevance. So that you're teaching something, that you get them to do something that's really relevant. So you don't teach them how to do a data management plan in the abstract. When You teach them when they need it and they've got something to do, and then it sinks in. And then they not only use it, but they will reuse the information over and over, and they will share it with their colleagues too. <clears throat> so online training, if you can do it, and webinars are great, and podcasts, the same sort of thing, are absolutely brilliant to have up on the web. The web pages are vital for to have the information so that the rest of the library staff can point to, here's the experts and here are the areas. And then this idea of that you can repurpose the big six in a whole lot of different ways. This is two, just two very quick examples. One is one thing that we started doing at an early stage because we were doing a lot of work with health sciences and we realised if we told them we were going to give them a health check, their own personal health check as regards their research impact. And for some reason that seems to work well for people. They're used to this from a medical point of view. So this is the, the Eiffel big six are actually embedded in this, but there's some more things here. There's a little bit more detail on that, and that's how we present it. In many cases, we'll do something, and, and I actually developed this based on what we did in Moldova. Believe it or not, I learned so much in, in Moldova from yourselves that I was able to take back what we learned and turn the, our bake-off, our boot camp, whatever we called it at the time. I started doing that, telling our, our researchers in different areas, we're going to do a workshop, you're going to come in, it's going to take you it depends, maybe 90 minutes, come in with your laptop. Where by the time you leave, you will be a better researcher. You're going to be a different person when you come out. You're going to have an ORCID ID. You're going to have a research profile. You're, going to, you're not going to leave the room until you have these things. And I guarantee you, these um, top six can actually be taught in less time than that. You can get that to the people, and they can sit down in a computer laboratory, and they can do all of those things, and you're going to save them so much time. You're going to be their best friend forever as a result of this, their hero. So the second thing, this just a very quick example, is on Monday, I was a bit preoccupied because this new course started off for every incoming doctoral student in my university. That's nearly 400 students. We went with a big bang, and I didn't know whether it was going to work or not on Monday morning, when, when, um, when, Tuesday morning, when, um, when we came here. So this is, course is called Research Integrity and Impact in an Open Scholarship Era. 
And the Dean of Graduate Studies, this great Professor Neville Cox, is a lawyer. He really embraced this because of the electronic thesis. He supported e-thesis and he started to really um, embrace um, open access and impact. As he said, this is the way of the future. And he created, he, his, was, this was his idea to create this course on research integrity. The big six are in here and they're being taught to all of these students. But they're kind of, they're, they're presented in a slightly different way, but they're in there. So what we're looking at on the side is research integrity. So that's research ethics and data management comes into part of that, especially personal information with the legislation and the regulations around that. Next thing, in comes Teresa and um, copyright and data protection, the law, who owns what, and the students get this, they get their plagiarism but they, and, and uh, warnings and how to um, guard against that, and they also get who owns the information. So this is starting with the basics. Then they go into data management and data security, and then, so these are other people, and I come in, I'm the, I should, forgot to say, I'm the course coordinator for my sins of this, of this. This is what I mean by being the victim of your own success. Um, scholarly communication and open research starts off with ORCID ID. The students will all be, their assignment is they're going to do an or have an ORCID ID. Research profile, their first profile is, give me the link to your research profile. I want to see it. That's their assignment third, and so on. The students are going to be required to write a very simple data management plan, a one-pager, to describe what their thesis, the kind of data they think they're, as if it's a research project. So they're being given these really practical skills that, they, um, that they'll be able to use throughout their whole research or career. And research evaluation, we're going to teach them about bibliometrics, altmetrics, social media, and they'll write a research impact case study. So those will be some of the first mention other beasts, they'll be the first guinea pigs on the, um, the uh, research um, Eiffel Big Six. So that's it. The last beast that I'll mention is the beautiful, noble creature that is the Arabian oryx, which is the national animal of Qatar. Adaptable, it's got these special feet that can walk in the, in the sands, you know, that, um, and it's even in very challenging environments. It's absolutely inspirational. It was ne nearly extinct, I believe, a few years ago, but with absolute determination and very special care and management, it is now back and thriving and so on. And I find it very inspirational. Obviously, I find the uh, National Library of Qatar very inspirational too, but I also know that you, as librarians, with all of the extraordinary work you're doing here in Eiffel, are also inspirational, and you will be able to take these beasts and really make the most of them, or at least I hope so. Thank you very much. I'm sure you're all exhausted, but if anybody has any questions, <laughs> or else we can, you know. Okay, uh, I'm very much impressed by your presentation. Really, <coughs> if you don't mind, uh, if you send us uh, this, this, this uh, your, your presentation, your slides for us, it will be a, a, a very nice. <coughs> so what I mean is. Uh, I'm from Addis Ababa University, Ethiopia. You know, we have a large, large, uh, you know, open access resources yes. at, at, the, at the university level. So we we have all almost thirteen thousand uh, digi uh, digitalized materials that that has access to worldwide, and you know, the, these materials are open for everybody, and the visibility is increased. Rina knows that that very well. So it, uh, the, the researchers are always requesting us. They need ORCID ID, and you know, their, their research is lost over there without, without you know, having copyright issues. So we didn't put that, that one, and we, are, we have tried through so the Ministry of Education to put that ORCID ID, mm -hmm. and, but the university is saying that I have already managed, uh, budgeted for the research, Mm -hmm. of the master's and the PhD dissertations. So I have, I, have, I have already assigned many for that. I'm the owner of the, that materials. So the researchers are saying that it is mine. So there is a confusion between the university and the researcher. Ah. 
what are what 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 do you advise for us to do how how do we convince the managers the university managers to continue to have orchid id for a personal you know researcher and uh, yeah, yeah to, to to make a profile yeah that that's a problem for us yes well um which is a problem for a lot of people because the universities, I understand that you've had great success with, um, with what you've been working on with open access and with the digital, digital side of things. I, we have had similar problems trying to convince our university to try and, and pay for an, open, for an ORCID subscription for the institution, for example. So the thing is that we don't have one. We don't have an ORCID subscription, and neither do... Most of the um, universities that I know, the only um, countries that I know who have a, an ORCID um, subscription are the countries who are using them for a national research evaluation. So they use them in Italy and um, I believe in Portugal that they've used them. So the government has paid for an ORCID subscription, but only so the government can see what's going on at that level and link in the ORCID ID with the Web of Science or with Scopus. Back in the real world, with us, we don't have the money to buy an institutional subscription. And to be honest, even though it would be nice for us to be able to see how many people have one, we don't really need one. Every now and then, every six months or so, I'll write to Josh Brown. You know Josh and ORCID? I'll give you his email address. And, um, and he'd be very glad to talk to you about this. Orchid would love to talk to you about it. They, um, he will tell me how many researchers in my institution have an Orchid ID. I can see the Orchid IDs in the Web of Science. So I can, now they're including them in that. So, and we've asked the researchers to voluntarily to put their go by themselves. And we're asking them, you don't even have to use your institutional um, address, but ideally you should use two email addresses. One, the email address for the institution, and two, another one, like a Gmail one or whatever else you've got, because your ORCID ID is for you as an individual, and you might move, and you may very well move out of that institution. You want your ORCID ID to go with you. So it's, it's, while it's useful for the institution, it's more useful for the individual. So we promote it to the individual, and forget about the university, really, you know? We know that it works for the university, and we know the university will eventually come on board. It's far more likely at the moment in my country that the government will follow the other countries if they can do a good deal with ORCID, and they'll buy an ORCID deal for the country to lift the research for the whole country up and to try and make it better for reporting. That's where the, the real interest is in that. But I'm not sure if that answers your question. We can talk about it later if you like. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to thank you very much for this powerful and rich presentation and valuable information. I know that uh, all my colleagues are impressed by that. Uh, so we might have uh, more questions later on because uh, we're tight with the uh, with, we're tight with the program. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my other question: Will you be available if we ask you to come and visit and give presentations in our country? Absolutely, I'd love to spend more time with you. <laughs>